Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's presentation from the Energy Club in London Business School. This is going to be a bit of a first for us, at least certainly for me, in that we're going to be trying to do some filming of the presenters as we go through. So just cut us a little bit of slack as we try going through some of the organisation around that. Um, a couple of years ago, I was working in Shell, and I remember sitting in one of the ca um, canteens there and having this discussion with a group of people about, about world oil and gas supply. And the, sort of the, the discussion went something like this, you know, there's this huge upward take up of the demand for oil and gas and the demand for energy in the global economy. And then we had and this one person was talking about you know, how this was up with trajectory and he just couldn't see it slowing down. This was before the recession hit. And another guy was talking about, well, he was a geologist, he was talking about what he saw in the way of supply was not only not going to meet this, but it was actually going to decrease from the sorts of levels that they had today. And he was then looking at this big gap between the demand that was acquired by oil and gas and the amount of supply that was going to be coming into the global marketplace. And uh, there's a third guy that was saying, yeah, 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 but Iraq's got these huge reservoirs, global class reservoirs, and there's lots of them, and they're going to be producing in the future. And that he expected that to be able to close this gap. Um, and then this somewhat dour person was then starting to talk about, well, there's lots of problems, though. Even if they can produce it, and that's not certain, what's going to be happening with the security problems. We've all heard about some of the problems that Iraq has been having over the last decade. What's going to be happening with the political problems? They've taken, at times, months and months to be able to even form a government. And then even if all of these things come together in a perfect nexus and, they, and you can start to see the production in a semi-stable environment, how is Iraq going to actually get the oil and gas out so that it can take part in this global need for energy supply and demand? So, that question's been nagging at me for the last 24, 36 months. And what I thought I would do today is share with you some of the world's best experts to answer some of these questions. Um, what we have here is, we allow me to introduce, and I'll do so more in a few moments, we have Adrian, we have Toby, we have Crispin, and we have Mike. And each one of these are here to be able to provide you with some back, either a backdrop or an answer to one of those questions. And what I'm going to do is very quickly introduce these people and then ask them to come up and start helping us, as a group, begin to understand some of the answers to what this question could be. Just before I do this, what I would like to do is do two things. The first is to share the understanding that this presentation is under the Chatham House Rule. And let's just be specific about what this is. The Chatham House Rule means that each one of you are welcome to quote what you hear to other people that you might meet outside. However, and this is really important for our presenters here, neither the company nor the person that is responsible for that quote, either from the presenters or from the audience, should leave this room. Does anybody have any questions about that? Is that clear of everyone? Because it's really important to everyone here. Okay, now that we've got that established, just before we start to move on to this question about Iraq and its place in the global energy supply, what I would like to do is spend a couple of moments, if I can, introducing the two co-presidents from the Alumni and the Energy Club from London Business School. We'd just like to make a brief, very brief, guys, come on, a brief um, introduction to you all and tell you something about their aspirations for the next year. Please, can you introduce yourselves and come up? Thank you, Robin. Uh, good evening, everyone. We're very glad to see you today. Uh, we hope that you'll enjoy this very promising and interesting event and topic. So my name is Gai Sajumalif, I'm the current MBA 2013 student. Uh, myself and Prasoon assumed the co-president's position recently, uh, we were elected. So by assuming the position, we would like to share with you our thoughts. Uh, we would like to make the club even better in future. We would like to build even better strategic networking platform for students, alumni and industry players. So for the benefit of all stakeholders, this is very important for us. Second point, we see a lot of alumni and executive uh, education people here today. And we'd like to express our, the importance of alumni and executive education people involvement in our activities. 
We hope to see more and more alumni involved uh, in our events. We even aim to reserve up to 25 to 40% of our seats for alumni and executive uh, MBA people uh, to make sure that, uh, that you are uh, actively involved in the Energy Club activities. So we have a lot of things to do and we, we would like to ask for your cooperation and support uh, for us to achieve uh, our goals. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, I'm, also, I'm Prasoon Kumar, uh, a co-president of the Energy Club. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, to give you a flavor of the events that are coming up in, the next, in, in this term and in the next um, other half of the year, uh, we have a few speakers from um, McKinsey, BCG, Morgan Stanley coming up in the next few months. All the information will be sent out through campus groups. And we welcome all the alumni to join us in all these events, even though these are student-focused events, but the alums are also welcome. And we will release further information as and when we plan the rest of the events. Thank you. Okay. So let's start this uh, presentation and discussion off. I would like to introduce to you Adrian Del Maestro. And let me just give you a brief introduction to why Adrian's here. This is the first time we've met. But a colleague of Adrian is Richard Verity, somebody who I met 15 years ago on Sloan, and have then once a year or so been on a telephone conversation or an email just talking to him. And I phoned him up and said, Richard, I need an expert on oil and gas, someone that can stand up in front of a, an energetic crowd and talk about the global oil and gas energy. Do you have anybody? And he said, I've got just the man for you. And with that, Adrian, perhaps you'd like to start us off and explain the the global position first. Fine, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, very briefly, uh, I'm the global director of research at Booz & Company, a well-known strategy consulting company, as you know. And I also worked at Ernst & Young heading up research, and I cover the oil and gas sector. So this is very much close to my heart what I'm going to talk about. A crude awakening. What I'm going to talk about tonight is I'm going to, I'm going to set the macro picture in terms of where oil demand is going, what's driving it. Then we're going to look at the global oil, supp oil uh, supply mix, see where the trends are and where Iraq potentially can fit into that. And then we'll dive a little bit into more detail and look at the potential of Iraqi oil reserves, the size of the prize. And then finally, we'll look at the production outlook. And more importantly, I shall touch upon some of the, the major constraints and factors that will impact Iraqi oil production. And we'll lead in nicely to see my colleagues who will cover these themes in a little bit more detail. So if we go on to the, the first slide, global oil demand. Uh, forgive me, I'll be turning my back to some of you here. Standard IEA forecast on the left-hand side. So global oil demand, key driver, it's going up. So around about 87 million barrels a day in 2010, rising to just under 100 million barrels by 2035. That's about half a percent KGAR growth through that period. Really, the key thing around that demand is a few themes coming out of that left-hand slide. You can see on the green side, that's OECD demand there, contracting over that period. And already by 2015, the non-OECD side of oil demand will be surpassing the OECD. As you well know, the major driver of that is demand in Asia, particularly China and India. If you look at the KGAR rates there, China growing at 2.1%, India at 3.4%, very much driving that demand. The type of oil demand there is very much transport demand. Again, if you look at, on the right-hand side there, 46 million barrels a day of transport demand rising to 60 million barrels a day. And that's mostly around road transport. And maybe just to give you an idea, um, I'm not sure how many of you follow the automotive sector, but just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the demand that's going to be happening, particularly in countries like China, Sales of light passenger vehicles in China in 2010 were of the order of 14 million vehicles. Um, if you look at the US, around about 12 million. Germany, a little bit closer to home, 3.5 million. By 2035, those sales of vehicles in China will reach 50 million vehicles. So enormous demand to give you an idea. So if that's broadly the oil demand picture, if you look at the supply side, um, on the next slide, on the left-hand side, you see world liquids production by type. If you look at the darker blue area there, that's conventional oil production. That's been pretty much plateauing the last few years and is already going into decline. Now, that decline will be around about 5% a year. 
There'll be enhanced oil recovery techniques that may slow down that decline, but it's pretty much going down southwards. In terms of new supply coming into the world, if you look at the top hand section there, the lighter gray, you've got unconventional oil beginning to impact there. So this is the likes of Canadian oil sands, Venezuelan heavy oil. You've also got, just underneath that, uh, natural gas liquids. I'm sure you've all followed the story of the shale gas revolution in the US. This is all the new supply coming in. In between those two tranches, you have fields yet to be found and fields yet to be developed. Now, there's something of the order of 21, billion, uh, 21 million barrels a day of new production coming in from those two sources. And particularly on the field yet to be developed, that's 16 million barrels a day that the IEA is forecasting of new production by 2020. It's in that space that Iraq has the potential to play in. And if we go on to perhaps the next slide, and this is where we talk a little bit more about Iraq here. And I'll be talking briefly about um, gas reserves, which is significant. But the main thing I wanted to bring your attention to is conventional oil reserves. Whatever way you cut the data, Iraq has enormous oil reserves. Third largest in terms of conventional reserves at around 143 billion barrels. Now, you may be aware that the, the size of reserves is a, is a sensitive subject, and, and Iraq raise their reserves upwards around about the end of 2010 by 25 percent. I think they were originally 115 ba billion barrels and they raised it to 143. And I think the thing to bear in mind here is while, while there may be some discussion around how these reserves are audited, the key thing is they have a lot of reserves. And something like 50 percent, maybe slightly over 50 percent of Iraq has been, has been explored. So there's a large chunk of Iraq that's underexplored. So enormous potential there. And even if you cut that data slightly differently, if you look at unconventional oil reserves, you might have Canada and Venezuela there, but Iraq will still be in the top five there. In terms of the potential of those reserves, you look at the reserves productions. On the right-hand side, the ratios there, I mean, quite clearly, Iraq stands out incredibly there. Nearly 160 years of production, enormous potential to be mined there. And maybe perhaps the most important point that doesn't really come out necessarily of that slide there, and forgive me if you, if you know this already, but international oil companies are facing a major uh, challenge right now in terms of growing their reserve space. And you will know that many of these companies are having to operate in frontier territory that's technically challenging and extremely costly. So if you think over the last, maybe the last year, you may be aware of Ken Energy in its attempts to discover oil in Greenland, it's but a few wells. Uh, there's a lot of activity in deep water, offshore West Africa. More recently, offshore East Africa is becoming a hotspot. The reason why a lot of these international oil companies are going into those regions is because of two, two key factors. One is the large reserves that are available that are easy to exploit are, are, are no-go zones for many of the IOCs. So if you think of all the oil in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, for example, they're, they're out of limits for the IOCs. Um, and, and, the, and the other challenge is also that the, as the IOCs try to grow, they're having to go into these, frontiers, these frontier areas. And you have host governments, for example, the, that are, can be quite aggressive to um, IOCs. So if you will have noticed recently in about the last week or so, Argentina nationalized YPF. You go back there, you have Venezuela nationalized assets 10, 15 years ago. And you may even remember, I'm not sure if we have any colleagues here from Shell, there was that unfortunate situation of Sakhalin II when Gazprom became the majority shareholder in that major project displacing Shell. So against that backdrop, what makes Iraq unique is you have very large oil reserves, I'll mention gas shortly, that are relatively easy to exploit and open to the international oil and gas community. So you have all types of players there, independents, majors, super majors, national oil companies. And finally, if we look at Iraqi oil production, you will be aware that there are some very aggressive targets set for Iraq in terms of oil production. So the plateau target of 13 million barrels a day by 2017. Now, there's a lot of talk already within government circles about how realistic those targets are. And if you look at the analyst forecasts there, there's a very broad range. Um, it's a brave man who's going to predict what those levels would be. But I think on the conservative side, at the lower end, you're talking about three and a half to four million barrels a day by uh, 2017. 
maybe at the higher end, seven, eight million, perhaps. And even were they to achieve those, that would be pretty significant. If you think of Saudi Arabia, it took them 80 years to build up their whole upstream infrastructure. Here's Iraq building it up in a significantly smaller time frame. <coughs> but the likelihood of Iraq meeting those production targets is very much going to be influenced by a number of factors. Now, that's not a comprehensive list on the right-hand side, but they're some of the key ones. And as I mentioned, my colleagues will develop some of these a bit more. Mike's going to talk a little bit about the security situation, but w what I would say about the security situation very briefly is there have been clearly lots of attacks on the infrastructure. Why only about a week or so ago, the main export pipeline from Kirkuk to Sehan, there were a couple of explosions on that pipeline on the Turkish side that impacted their exports. So clearly the, the security situation will be a major factor in terms of how they can grow production. As they grow production, they're going to have to export it. I mean, Iraq makes a lot of money out of um, oil exports, something last year of the region of $83 billion. It's important to their economy. It's the main source of revenue to grow their, their economy. There is a limit right now to how much they can export. Most of the exports are coming out of the south from the port of Basra. Current export volumes are around about 2.3 million barrels a day. There are a number of projects online to grow that capacity. So there are a number of single point mooring systems that are going to be introduced that will increase capacity to around about 4.5 million barrels a day. Those projects have already started. So one already was online at the beginning of this year. The second one's just been inaugurated. And the third and fourth single point mooring system due to come online over the next couple of years. But the ability to grow this export capacity will be fundamental for allowing them to have that production growth. Labor and equipment availability. I mean, the sheer logistics of, of the development that's required in Iraq is huge. Uh, we're talking about 800 to maybe 1,000 wells being drilled every year. If you think of all the rigs that need to be in place, I've seen figures of the, of the order of 300 to 350 rigs in use at any one time. And then you think of the amount of staff, uh, operators that are required to operate the equipment, the technical skills required. It's a huge endeavor, and it will be unprecedented in the Middle East. So big question mark around that. Bureaucracy, uh, there's a lot of talk certainly amongst the uh, international oil companies operating there, about some of their plans being stymied by bureaucracy. And again, there's a couple of examples recently where any, the Italian oil and gas company that's operating the Zuber consortium, is leading that one. And they are, recently their production levels have eased off to two, around 250,000 barrels a day. And one of the issues that they've raised is, is the slow response from the government to give them planning consent to develop more wells. And that's quite a common feature. So bureaucracy will be an issue going forward. The next couple of points, uh, sustainability and, and water injection levels, they're related. So on the sustainability side, there is, there's not a lot of hard data about this that's in the public domain, but there's certainly a concern that these reservoirs, the oil reservoirs, particularly in the south, where a lot of the production is, are being pushed quite aggressively because of these uh, aggressive ramp-up targets. And there's concerns about how quickly they will be depleted. And certainly that raises the issue of water injection in terms of enhancing oil recovery. Now, the plans currently in place now are with regards to ExxonMobil, who's also the operator of the West Kona One Consortium. Exxon's leading a major initiative to bring seawater through to the south, where most of these fields are, to enhance oil recovery. This is going to be a huge endeavor. It's something like 12 million barrels a day of seawater that will be required for enhanced oil recovery. And the figures I've seen in terms of the size of the project is, is around about 10 billion US dollars. So major endeavor, and clearly some concern about how they will be able to deliver on that. And just, again, my colleagues will talk about the political landscape, but just to give you a flavor of the, of the complexity of all of this, ExxonMobil is not exactly in the good books of the Iraqi government right now. They went off and signed six exploration licenses with the Kurdish regional government. And the uh, Ir Iraqi government decided to ban them from any further developments. Uh, so you have the fourth licensing round now for exploration plays. And officially, um, Exxon's banned from that. But on the one hand, the Iraqi government may say that, but are they going to kick Exxon out? Well, uh, it would be unwise, given that they're leading this major initiative. But clearly, lots of complexity to all of this. And the final point, uh, management of associated gas. So 
most of the gas that's produced in Iraq is co-produced alongside oil, so associated gas. And there's very limited infrastructure right now to capture and process this gas, so most of it's being flared. Um, something of the order, I think it's about 70% of it's being flared. In terms of volumes, we're talking probably around about 700 million cubic feet a day, which um, may not sound too much, but if you convert it into a dollar value, it depends which gas price you take, but even if you take a conservative gas price like Henry Hub, you're talking about one and a half million dollars a day that's being flared, rounding it up. $450 million a year of lost revenue. I've seen figures going much higher up to a billion. So there, there's a lot of gas that's being wasted there. Um, and there is a major project being led by um, Shell, a joint venture with Mitsubishi, 17 billion joint venture to create the infrastructure to capture this gas, to use it for power generation, which I'll talk about in a, sh in a, in a moment, um, and, and also to potentially export it. On the on the, on the power demand side, just to, just to mention, there's enormous demand for electricity in Iraq. There are lots of uh, power cuts quite often throughout the day. So there's a very big need to meet local demand for, for power, and gas will help that. And while there may have been, or while there may be some sensitivity about how that gas is used once gas demand is met, there's the opportunity for Iraq to potentially export this gas. And suddenly the Shell project involves an LNG facility to be built for export. The final thing I would just mention about gas, and I've focused very much on oil, is that Iraq clearly has lots of gas, uh, reserves of about 112 trillion cubic feet that put it in the top 12 uh, resource holders. So I think the next big thing in Iraq is how they develop their gas. And the final thing I would say, and I think, Robin, I'm running on time, um, a, lot of, a lot of this, what I've talked about, is around oil and around gas. And certainly if you read a lot about Iraq, um, Industry commentators always refer to Iraq as the bright spot on the global oil supply mix. So we have this country that has the potential to bring a lot of oil onto the market that will meet our thirst and our demand for oil, potential implications for the oil prices. You can imagine if too much oil comes onto the market. But uh, Iraq's actually much bigger than that. They're, they're focusing very much on their upstream sector now, but as they develop their upstream sector, they're going to develop their midstream sector for gas processing, the exports that I mentioned, and they'll develop their downstream sector in refining in petrochemicals, so all these different energy products, these refined products, will be having an impact on the global supply and demand balance. So you can well appreciate that governments, industry players, industry observers are all watching how Iraq evolves because its impact is going to be much broader in the energy mix. So I've thoroughly enjoyed watching Iraq evolve, and I think the best is yet to come, so I hope you will be tracking it as well going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adrian. One of the key points from this, is, as you raised in your discussion, was a question about Iraq's stability as a country itself. How is it going to grow and develop, in a very short amount of time, the institutional capability of managing bureaucracy and managing politics? And to help us get an understanding of this, we've invited Dr. Toby Dodd, who's a lecturer, who's a reader in um, Who's a, who's a reader in international relations at LSE. Now, I promised him that we won't hold this against him. And, and at any rate, we're only going to be taking questions when it comes to later on in the section. So we're not going to give him too much of a rough time. But, but Toby, could you please come up and tell us what you think of the future for political stability within Iraq? Thank you. Um, I think I might be the skunk at this wedding because after that incredibly optimistic and uh, powerfully kind of visionary uh, look at the role that Iraq can play in an international oil market, I wonder if it's going to, and I suspect I'm rather sceptical about that. And I think um, there, are, there are a couple of reasons for that. I've, uh, I've studied Iraq nearly all my adult life. Uh, I know very little but Iraq. And I've studied Iraq through bad times and worse times. And I think we're now back to bad times and we may be heading into worse times. So. Although uh, Iraq is often referred to as the Klondike of the Middle East, it sits on this great untapped reservoir of oil, there's a reason for that. It has been since 1958, and especially since 1968, unstable, then very stable, but extremely violent. So that's the, that's the problem. So where do we start our understanding of Iraq? We could start in March 2003, when the US administration 
invaded the country specifically because of that instability, wanted to sweep away the 35 years of Ba'athist rule, wanted to drive the million people who had been associated with the Ba'ath Party out of power. And what it did was then set up a radically ambitious new political structure. Now, the good news, the Klondike of the Middle East, the visionary hope for the oil markets, is that to, to, we could say that that democratic structure led to power being transferred three times from Prime Minister, from temporary Prime Minister Ayad Alawi to Ibrahim al Jafari in 2005, and then to the current Prime Minister Nouri al Maliki. The elections of 2010, big turnout, hung vote, split vote, and then intense, complex negotiations between all the different um, players from March to November, peaceful, that resulted in another national unity government, Maliki staying on as Prime Minister. So I think that's the good news, and that would lead us to the kind of George Bush uh, junior vision of Iraq as a beacon of democracy and supplying this need of oil. Now the bad news, as you're all perfectly aware of, I think that Iraq 2005, six, we could argue about the dates, descended into civil war, there were thousands of people were killed. It's kind of staggered out, I think, after 2007, eight, into a holding position, and Mike's going to talk about this, where it's still very violent. And I think the most likely outcomes from that position are either um, a dictatorship with the current Prime Minister moving on to secure his grip over power, which would give us stability, or a descent back into civil war. So I think the horizon of Iraq doesn't confirm uh, George, George Bush's vision, but it also is highly problematic. Can we go to the next slide, thank you. So tonight what I want to do in, in the last uh, 10 or 12 minutes is run through five <laughs> themes, I think. Firstly, look at the basis to Iraqi politics. Then look at the national elections of March 2010, the agreement that drove them out of there. But the t and then anchor or justify my negativity in what I've called the rise and rise of Nouri al-Maliki and then the political exclusion today of key factions within Iraqi politics that I think are going to be uns unstable. Now, if we look at the elite basis to politics in Iraq, after 2003, after that ruling elite of 35 years, a brutal dictatorial elite had been swept from power, um, the American, uh, American administration occupation empowered a, a set of Iraqi politicians and political parties that had largely been absent from the country under Saddam Hussein. And we could understand that because if they'd have been present, they'd have been murdered. But it empowered also a vision of Iraqi politics which divided society along ethnic and religious lines. Now, if, you, if we go to the next slide, the first group who were empowered were the Kurdish parties, the Kurdistan Democratic Party and the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan. Masoud Barazani is now the president of the Kurdish regional government, that area in the north that fought for and finally got the autonomy it needed from Baghdad in 1990, uh, 91. And Jalal Talabani, his rival for power, who then, uh, who is now the president of Iraq. The next group of three main organizations stepped forward to claim they were representing the majority population of Iraq, the Shias. We have Amar al-Hakim, who took over his father's party, the Islamic Supreme Council of Iraq. Um, co was, was, the Islamic Supreme Council of Iraq was formed in, in Iran in 1982 as the vehicle for Iranian foreign policy in Iraq, something the Americans forgot when they empowered them, but also the main focus of this talk to Nouri al-Maliki, now the head of the Dawah Party and the Prime Minister of Iraq since 2006. And then we come to Muqtad al-Sadr, this radical young um, religious figure with, I think, a la probably the largest popular movement in Iraq, who was one of the main key players in, on one side of the civil war that ripped Iraq apart. And then finally, we have the two groups who, de depending on which day of the week you meet them, would label themselves as Sunni representing the Sunnis of Iraq or the secular parties. Ayad Alawi and his party, Iraqia, who've tried to reach out to the secular middle classes of, of Iraq, 
and then Tariq al-Hashimi, the former head of the Iraqi um, Islamic Party, vice president of Iraq and currently the subject of an Iraqi government arrest warrant um, that claims that he was responsible for an extended campaign of murder. So these are basically the runners and the riders, the political organizations uh, who are s competing, squabbling, and occasionally agreeing over politics. Now, what has this system given us in Iraq? Well, it's given us three governments of national unity, um, where basically all of these players bar, uh, have been brought together in cabinets after elections and given ministerial positions. Why would this bother you if you're doing business in Iraq? Well, with those ministerial positions has come comparative immunity to stuff payrolls full of political place people, your friends, family, followers, and faction members, but also to use the resources of the Iraqi government either to fund political mobilization or in a lot of cases to fund a house buying spree not so far from this very building. So that means that Iraq is considered to be one of the most corrupt countries in the world. The, um, the uh, Transparency International, I think, thinks it's now the seventh most corrupt when it was the fourth most corrupt. The World, that, uh, the world Bank, oh, that puts it um, ahead of Somalia, North Korea, Burma, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Turkish, Turkmenistan, but, and on par with Haiti. These aren't countries that we would be rushing to do business in. The world, um, uh, the world Bank has a worldwide governance indicators. It rates 200 nations on a score of 1 to 100 on their commitment to anti-corruption. Iraq scored five points in 2010. This is an extremely permissive business environment for corruption, and any or, or, um, international oil company dealing in Iraq has to be aware of that. I would argue, more worryingly still, is that this political system, these governments of national unity, at points in the past have excluded the Sunni and secular parties or picked Sunni and secular parties that haven't been representative of their core constituency and pushed them out. That's clearly what happened in 2005, and that exclusion and alienation was one of the direct contributing factors to the civil war. I'm arguing after the elections of 2010, that's happening again. Ayad Alawi, the leader of Iraqia, is a very unhappy man, spending a great deal of time with his family. I think the house is down in Richmond, not a great deal of time in Baghdad. Tariq al-Hashimi, for reasons that will be obvious to you, also isn't spending any time in Baghdad at the moment and won't, I suspect, be going back there soon. But there, thanks. Now, this takes us to, what I think, what could have been, we were talking about in, in the bar earlier, when we were and weren't optimistic the elections of 2010. And again, you see those great uh, coalitions that I touched upon, the state of law run by Nouri al-Maliki, then the incumbent prime minister, then the Iraqi National Alliance run by Amar Hakim and Muqtad al-Sadr, Iraqia run by Ayad al-Lawi, and then the Kurdish Alliance. The election was incredibly fractious. The debathification, this driving of people close to the old regime and a wider community believed to be associated with them from power was used as a key electoral tactic to target Iraqia and try and rule a great slab of their people out of the, um, out of the running. If you jump to the next slide. What happened because of that was that Iraqia maximized its votes when people came to the ballot box and said, no, we won't be driven out. We will invest our hope in the ballot box. And if uh, that, that would be largely the Sunni community in Baghdad and across the Northwest. Uh, the state of law in Maliki um, did very well as well, slightly less with 89 seats to Iraq, Iraqia's 91, and he didn't believe it. When the electoral re results were announced, he said, this will not and this cannot stand, demanded a recount. They didn't demand a recount as you would uh, think that uh, Nick Clegg or David Cameron might do as head of their political parties. He issued his demand for a recount 
as head of the armed services of Iraq. And we'll get to that, why that's so significant in a minute. And then you have the Iraqi National Alliance, that other vehicle for Shia votes, getting 18.5% of the seats. This happened in March, actually I think the 7th of March 2010. Deadlock. Deadlock for two reasons. Firstly, all the other politicians outside the state of law were petrified that if Nouri al-Maliki got a second term, he would move towards consolidating his grip and become a dictator. But all the other parties, apart from um, Iraqia, five minutes? Oh, okay. Well, thanks. All the other parties, apart from Iraqia, were petrified by this large turnout of votes from the Sunni population, more broadly in the nationalist and secularist population, that it would overturn the political settlement created since 2003. So if I were sitting in the audience as an Iraqi politician and I wasn't in Iraq here, I'd be saying, do I want revolution or do I want dictatorship? And as good politicians, in November 2010, they came to what they thought was a compromise, the so-called Irbil Agreement, where Nouri al-Maliki agreed, I think in a 14-point agreement, to have his hands tied a little bit. He said, oh no, I won't appoint the uh, Minister of Interior myself or the Minister of Defence, and I'll allow a collective go uh, body of national unity of all these politicians to steer uh, strategic decision making. So then we move forward to now. What has happened? Well, Nouri al Maliki refused, rejected the six candidates put forward by Iraqia for the Ministry of Defence. He put a, a, a minor politician, Sardoun al Dalemi, a nice chap, but not a powerful politician, as the temporary Minister of Defence, and he's still the acting Minister of Interior. He appointed uh, one of his key allies as national security advisor. So the Ear Bill Agreement has been shredded. Now, why should that worry you, me, or the Iraqi politicians not in the state of law? Well, since when uh, uh, Nouri al-Maliki was elected, or when he, he took power, when he was given power in 2006, he was seen to be a weak, fractious, incompetent politician. You travel through Baghdad and there were gossip and rumors. When is he going to be thrown out? When is he going to be removed? Now you travel through Baghdad and the gossip, the fracture, the worry is, when is he coming for us? When is he becoming from the politically, when is he going to consolidate power? He has centralized his power, centralized his power by focusing on the arm of the military arms of the state. He set, up, um, he, he set up his private office, appointed his son as deputy commander-in-chief, appointed himself as commander-in-chief, has moved to tie senior generals who should be, uh, who should, whose appointment should be agreed by parliament to himself, designated their appointment temporary so there's no parliamentary oversight. There are 6,000 members of the Iraqi Special Forces, considered by the American military to be some of the best trained. When they were in the region, they should know they trained them. When they were handed them back over, their control over to the Iraqi state, Nouri al-Maliki set up a, a ministerial body to control them, to remove them from parliamentary oversight. They're now called the Jaysh al-Maliki, which is, if you know much about it, uh, Iraqi history, is a kind of, um, the, uh, the Fedayeen al-Maliki, which is a, um, a kind of a crude and, and, and dark joke comparing them to the Fedayeen al-Saddam under Saddam Hussein. I think Nouri al-Maliki is showing clear, undeniable signs of trying to move towards a dictatorship. And again, if we were sitting in the company offices, we'd say, what's wrong with that? We can do business with a dictator. We do so all over the world. Stability. What worries me is in doing that, he's moving to exclude... Iraq here, the Iraqi national movement, who took 24% of the vote from power. The, per the persecution of Tariq al-Hashimi, the, uh, the, the vice president of Iraq, is specifically meant to break that electoral alliance. That leaves that 24.72% of voters excluded from power in a way they're excluded 
in 2005 and 6 that led to a civil war. Now, Michael, tell us whether it's likely there's ever going to be a civil war again, but Nur al Maliki's move towards dictatorship is alienating great swathes of the population, driving them into opposition when in 2010 they invested their hope in the ballot box. That's not a recipe for, secure, uh, for stability and certainly not for democracy. Thanks a lot. Toby, thank you very much. So what that told me, what that's given me, is an insight into the political way that Iraq is working at the highest level. But what really interests me, Mike, is how that is going to be actioned onto the ground. How is this large political framework going to actually translate itself into um, instability or not on the ground? And I wonder perhaps if you could give us some insights into that. What right. I'd like to do is to introduce um, a colleague of mine, Mike. Sorry, I forgot to do this. A colleague of mine, Mike. Um, Mike works for the Olive Group as vice president of their analytics. And in many ways, he's been one of the reasons why I decided to set up this presentation. And that we've um, had a correspondence going for about the last 36 months or so. And um, Mike's key insights into the way that security develops within Iraq has been something that I wanted to be able to bring to our colleagues here. And it was for that reason that I, you've been kind enough to come over from the United States to be able to give us a part of this presentation. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks. So uh, just to give you a slight bit of background on myself and on Olive, uh, I've uh, been doing uh, Iraq uh, not as long as uh, Toby, uh, but uh, for all of my adult, adult life, which is a little bit shorter than Toby's adult <laughs> life. Um, and uh, I've... Uh, I initially came in as a journo. I did my PhD on Iraq at the Department of War Studies, King's College London, and uh, eventually I started using my Iraq expertise uh, to both uh, help inform policy, uh, failed, <laughs> and, uh, but also, uh, it wasn't my fault, uh, and, uh, and, also, uh, and also to help people who are operating on the ground, which is, to be honest, one of the most satisfying things I've been able to do with uh, theoretical expertise, and to also get out to Iraq an awful lot. And when you're operating with a security company, uh, that helps people to do business in Iraq, um, you get out there a lot, and that's one of the best piece, pieces of the job. So, let's move on. So, first thing I'm going to ask you, uh, yeah, move on one more. First thing I want to say to you is a little bit about um, how do we know what's going on on the ground in Iraq right now? I work with uh, US government a fair bit, and one of the things that they're struggling with is the fact that without the troops on the ground, it's very difficult to understand what the security environment is, particularly out in the provinces away from Baghdad. Uh, one of the things that Olive Group has set up uh, down in Basra province, where most of the oil and gas providers are, we've set up something called the Business Solution Operations Centre. Um, and it's uh, in the Chateau Arab Hotel, which is this beautiful old colonial um, hotel uh, on the uh, Chateau Arab River uh, with its own airfield. It's where the uh, Gulf Sheikhs used to fly in for the weekend. Uh, to, uh, to spend uh, their weekend in cosmopolitan uh, Basra in the uh, 60s uh, and the 70s. And uh, this beautiful old hotel is now the headquarters of the Basra Operations Centre, which is the Iraqi uh, supreme headquarters, basically, for security in Basra province, where such a great majority of the, uh, of the oil production is coming from. So we established a uh, joint uh, information sharing cell with them. I have an analytical team based in there and I regularly visit the, uh, this beautiful site. Um, it's, uh, it's the only way to get information anymore is to embed and liaise very, very closely with the, uh, with the local authorities. Um, there's no US military out there anymore gathering this sort of intelligence, so you've got to go in and do it yourself. Okay. And just to give you a quick look at the Chateau Arab, you know, faded glory of, uh, you know, of old Basra. Uh, and uh, you can see on all of the walls there, there's, uh, you know, beautiful technicolour pictures of old Basra. This was all done by the Brit military when we were there uh, for the uh, local dignitaries to hold their meetings. But it's a beautiful location. And there's so many, uh, we've got all the agencies in there at the moment. There's the uh, army, top left. There's the police with the sinister eye in the middle of, the, uh, of, of Iraq. Uh, you have the, uh, the border enforcement guys, you have the Air Force, the Navy, the oil police, the traffic police, God bless them, uh, the, uh, the Facilities Protection Service and the National Information Investigations Agency, the Eagle. And then you also have the watchers, the little eyes uh, looking everywhere, which is the civilian intelligence agencies 
whose uh, power has really, really grown, uh, particularly in the last year, and particularly since the, uh, the US uh, withdrew. Uh, parallel intelligence agencies uh, have been created very, very quickly, falling back on old habits, shall we say. And they answer directly to Baghdad, and, uh, and I'll leave it there for the moment. We can take it up in Q&A. Okay. One of the other things we do is we watch the Iraqi security forces very, very closely because one of the key indicators for whether or not the country can uh, remain stable uh, to the extent it is now is whether the security forces are able to do their job. The, uh, the big question was always, can they stand up as we stand down? Well, ultimately, the question is yes, they did. Uh, they've fallen back on just the way the government and industry has fallen back on old habits and the way it does things, lots of bureaucracy unfortunately still corruption uh, to a great degree. Uh, the security forces also have fallen back on a much simpler, more traditional way of operating. You don't prevent incidents, uh, you follow up afterwards, you arrest the, uh, a, a number of individuals, a large number, and hopefully in this dragnet you find the, uh, they find the right person. So it's a reactive model of security they've moved to because they simply don't have the capabilities that the US had. When the US left, they lost their unmanned aerial vehicles, the drones, they lost their access to satellite imagery, signals intelligence, cell phone intercept, everything like that went, so they went back to a much more simple and old-fashioned way of operating. So, move on. Um, the conflict very briefly since 2003. So somebody who followed this uh, every day in and out, uh, you know, it was uh, truly terrible uh, in late 2006, early 2007 when the Civil War type conditions were raging. Uh, you know, at that point, uh, we were seeing 6,000 incidents a month in some case. We were really up there. Now uh, we have as many incidents in a year as we used to have in a month. Uh, that shows you the sort of uh, improvement that we had. The surge, uh, however it was, whether it's the US element of the surge or the Iraqi element of the surge, and whether it's just conflict fatigue and uh, 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 the sectarian communities becoming homogenized within certain parts of Baghdad due to the, the, uh, the cleansing, the sectarian cleansing. Whatever the combination of reasons, it declined very, very rapidly. And, uh, and from about uh, 2008 onwards, uh, we were in a greatly improved environment. And uh, one of the things, there's a big debate going on at the moment as to whether security is getting worse again. Uh, and some of my articles seem to be sort of prime movers in, 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 in people assessing whether or not uh, security is really getting better. But I just want to put this in context. Um, whatever happens, it's, I think it's extremely unlikely we're ever going to get back to the Civil War-like conditions. The debate really is, from my perspective, over whether Iraqi security improvement has stalled, whether it's stagnating. In other words, whether it just can't get any better than it is right now for a long, long time. And of course, at the moment, it's bad enough that it can put off people from investing in the country. It puts off non-oil investors. It puts off uh, people being able to uh, uh, come in and operate uh, effectively and efficiently. In other words, the security costs of operating in Iraq put many companies off of coming into this market that otherwise they would be in like a shot. And this is something that I guess companies like Oliver are trying to get their head around, which is how do we adapt to the fact that the Iraqis are soon going to be stripping out most of the foreign security companies and everybody wants to reduce the amount they're, exp they're spending on security. And in some ways technology and other things that you can provide I think will help them to do that. But again, we can take more of that up in Q&A. So looking at threat metrics at the moment, this is March 2012. Now, any set of threat figures you see, these are violent incidents um, that go from serious organised crime and, and up to, uh, you know, suicide car bombs. Any set of incidents you see are wrong. Any, any set of metrics you see are wrong. The question is how wrong. I think that uh, at the moment, using our sources, our level of interface with the Iraqi security forces... Uh, which I think is about the best that there is out there, we are almost getting half. So you can probably double whatever you see here. But let's put this in context. If you look at Baghdad, uh, you know, 84 incidents in a month. Let's say, uh, you know, let's say it was uh, 200 in a month or 210 in a month. You're still talking about uh, seven incidents a day in a city of seven million people. 
Now imagine if a very small uh, bomb exploded underneath a car two miles in that direction. It's unlikely you'd even hear it. Imagine a person got shot uh, 500 metres away at a checkpoint with a silenced pistol. Uh, you wouldn't even know it happened. And this is very much the way Baghdad is. Apart from the very large high profile attacks, car bombs, which uh, are happening with increasing fre frequency but still not a daily occurrence, most of these cities keep rolling. In other words, Iraq has basically got a, a tremendous uh, insensitivity to violence at the moment. And there are some people in Iraq who their life is twice as dangerous as it was five years ago, like the Sunni tribal leaders who backed the coalition uh, and now being picked off one by one defenceless. Uh, but for most people in Iraq, it doesn't feel that way. Most of them are getting on with life. And if you look at Baghdad every morning, millions of people get up, go to work, travel from one side of the city to the other. That's the way traffic flows in, uh, in Baghdad. The workers come from the east often. Uh, into, the, into the west. Many people go to ministries over on the, uh, on the East Bank and other places. So it doesn't tend to interfere with things and it certainly doesn't interfere with the oil and gas sector. So um, one thing I'd say is, uh, you know, throughout the country, one thing I do is to basically look at um, the level of risk in each of the oil fields. And uh, even, just to give an example, in the KRG, a very safe area where there's very limited security risks, uh, even in an area like that, one has to look very closely at what's happening within the individual uh, concessions. All security and all politics in Iraq is local. So you can have, some, you can have a very unsafe area, and 40 kilometres away, it's extremely safe. Some threats don't travel, others do. So if you look at, for instance, the KRG, you've got to take into account everything. You've got to take into account the risks related to the borders, uh, Iranian, Turkish... Uh, based uh, terrorist groups or insurgent groups. You've got to take into account unexploded ordnance that Saddam laid or during the Anfal era. You've got to take into account threats coming from federal Iraq into the KRG. We can talk in more detail about anywhere in Iraq later. So a very, very rough, um, uh, simple way of showing where most of the incidents uh, are uh, in any given month in northern Iraq. And it's really based around uh, the old uh, Saddam era uh, areas uh, along the Tigris River Valley uh, where there's still um, uh, you know a strong enough Al Qaeda presence that they stop the places from feeling secure and they stop uh, government forces and, and they will stop oil companies from operating there uh, unless they can get very very strong reassurance about being able to operate in these environments but most of the particularly the western oil companies will look very very uh, dimly at some of these uh, northern areas um, Realistically, the mo the most of the, if we look at since December 2011, I, my view is there has been an undoubted increase in violence across Iraq. Think about this for a second. Uh, US forces withdrew completely, no longer there on the roads, uh, removing most of the equipment. Uh, and we probably uh, had reduced incident reporting from the time US forces left. So in theory, the number of incidents reported should be going down. Less US targets to hit, less reporting coming in from US forces on the ground. Instead, uh, violence has slowly risen, as you saw with one of the previous graphics. And if you take out all the other factors, what it shows you is that Iraqi on Iraqi violence in the north central provinces, the predominantly Sunni areas that have been, uh, to put it mildly, very ticked off uh, since, uh, since the US left and since uh, Prime Minister Maliki has been accused of, uh, of starting to really crack down on the uh, uh, some of the Sunni political parties than to break his opponents uh, in the uh, Sunni political uh, community. Uh, you know, North Central Iraq has become significantly more violent since US withdrawal. Now, will that continue or will it burn out? Uh, that's something, again, we can take forward in, uh, in, in a discussion. And more of the same, basically. Uh, the key point for me to look at is the area just south of Baghdad. This is the only place in Iraq right now, and we see these things down to a very detailed level, where I see true potential for a return to sectarian conflict. Babel province, uh, the first place to really clean up during the surge. The thing that showed everyone that this can really work. Sunni and Shia tribal groups together starting to crack down on the extremists from each of their communities. Now we start to see northern Babel start to come apart again with uh, deliberate antagonistic attacks by one sectarian group against another and then the retaliatory response that the uh, Al-Qaeda was hoping to 
get uh, Shiite extremist groups to mount retaliatory attacks? They do. So we're just seeing the starting of something very ugly there. Will it continue? Who knows? Just a brief graphic to... This is the stuff that we see on the television. Mass casualty attacks, car bombs. A cautionary note. Uh, it's, it's not really the most important thing that's going on in the country. It doesn't affect the oil industry almost at all because hardly any of it happens in the south. Uh, and when it does, it doesn't happen on concession. It's almost entirely targeted against soft targets. Al-Qaeda in Iraq has rebounded in a big way. Its operational tempo is far, far higher than it used to be. And the reason for that predominantly, apart from US leaving, is that between 2009 and now, uh, an unprecedented crop of experienced terrorists were, were, uh, were basically released from uh, the coalition prisons. Think about it. Every year they add a new crop of Al-Qaeda in Iraq guys, and many of them get captured. They sit there in, uh, in Camp Bucha and Camp Cropper and they discuss where they went wrong and what they're going to do in the future. They start to radicalise individuals who were brought in there for no good reason whatsoever. And then suddenly they're all released at once. It's an unprecedented uh, uh, reintegration of terrorist manpower into the, the global uh, manpower pool. Baghdad. What's interesting about this is that despite the increase in incidents across north central Iraq, it has not happened in Baghdad. There's two reasons for that. One, the city is locked down very tight indeed. It's quite a heavily garrisoned city and they're very, very robust about how they deal with the local communities, which is not always helpful. It's really counterproductive in many cases, but it, it restricts the number of attacks. And then secondly, we have not seen the sectarian violence within the city. I think it has burned itself out and the communities have separated to some extent. In the south, where we have most of the oil, and uh, obviously most of the oil is, is based uh, just uh, north and west of, uh, of Basra and Zubair, you see there. We also have a number of concessions uh, beginning to come to production or at, already at production up in Maysan province, where you see Amara and Majar al Kabir. And then we see, and then we've got a number of the, uh, the concessions in uh, Dikar province, where you see Nazaria. So, Southern Iraq is still much, much quieter, and the level of violence, the seriousness of violence, the destructiveness of it, far, far lower. Most of the incidents you see across southern Iraq are of an uh, intra-community uh, between groups of clerical followers, between organised crime factions, uh, between feuding Shiite political parties. This stuff never touches the oil sector, at the moment at least. And so... Pay attention to the scale on the left. This is far, far lower level of incidents than you saw in the previous slide. And most of these incidents there are related to two or three interlocking uh, feuds uh, between political, clerical and criminal groups. It doesn't take much to push the numbers up, but the numbers are very low and it just, it just never affects the concessions. To give you an example, this is the sort of stuff that happens across the south. And pay your attention to uh, hand grenade booby trap used to speed up divorce dispute. <laughs> this is a little bit, it gives you a little bit of a taste of, of how Iraq is now, which is that it's a place where small arms and explosives have become so proliferated across the entire society. And small arms are, are like, um, it's like sowing salt in the ground. You can never get these things out. Once they're in, they're never coming out again. And uh, this is one of the things that means you have an extraordinarily long tail off in terms of stabilisation. It's very hard to stabilise these kind of places. In terms of pipeline attacks, which uh, really starts to bring us to the point as to whether this sort of thing can disrupt oil and gas, I'll tell you honestly, not much of what happens in Iraq security-wise has a decisive effect on the operation of oil and gas concessions. It might stop uh, new exploration and some uh, development of the northern and, and central areas. It might. But where the near-term oil production and expansion increases is, is going to come from, uh, it has almost no ability to really seriously affect that. You would need there to be a war between uh, the US and Iran and for the Iranians to make a, uh, a decision to really seriously escalate in Iraq uh, for, there to be e for it to even begin to impact uh, the oil concessions really seriously. Uh, but, and we can talk about some of these scenarios because, you know, they're serious. Uh, but in reality, in most scenarios... Uh, there's almost nothing that can leverage these guys out of the concessions, except for disputes with the Iraqi government. So, 
These are the guys who got arrested for doing pipeline attacks all the way through the second half of 2011 down in Basra. It's a good example of what the level of threat against oil and gas is really in the country. It's related to pay disputes involving oil police and oil unions. It's uh, local uh, provinces uh, being discontented about how much fiscal authority they have. All of these things tend to roll into one and then you'll get a small set of demonstrative attacks against pipeline ta pipelines and tanks that are deliberately configured not to cause long-term effect. And then once the political dispute between Shia factions has been resolved, for the moment at least, you find a bunch of guys and you arrest them and they disappear. So, concluding thoughts. You better remind me what my thoughts are. I said it very well. <laughs> your Next, thoughts, please. Your, your <laughs> oh. I wrote them down so I'd remember them. <laughs> so, so, Toby's already talked about this, but um, there will be no major political changes, in my mind anyway, before the 2014 elections, dot, dot, dot. What will they be like? Will they be managed elections? Will it be a managed transition? It's very easy to do that in Iraqi politics, the way the system's structured. You can just form whatever coalition you want before, during or after the elections. And, uh, you know, if you've decided that three or four of your factions are going to get just about enough votes, you can make the deal, see if you'll perform roughly on, uh, on track, and then you've got your government. It was decided before the first vote was counted. The security uh, forces... Their iron grip tactics are very unproductive uh, in, most of, in most of the areas where they operate. My view, you know, if I look to the future, my worst case scenario is that north central Iraq is a place which feels a little bit like Shiite Bahrain. These sullen, isolated, heavily garrisoned communities where the security forces don't dare to patrol at night, where there is never any investment, there is never any development, and they are just the badlands forever. It's not a strategic threat to the country. It doesn't stop the oil coming out of the south. But it's a constant irritant to anybody operating there. And there's just a whole section of the country that doesn't work and will not work for a huge period of time. As we see with Bahrain, this stuff can get uh, deeply ingrained in the way a country works. And it's almost impossible to peacefully resolve in the long term. That's the centre, right? The area around the back. Correct, yeah. That's the north central provinces. So it's... Uh, to, it's not really Anbar because they get left to do their own devices. It's Salahuddin, Diyala, uh, bits of Baghdad, Nineveh province where Mosul is, uh, and bits of Kirkuk as well uh, that the Kurds don't hold. So my bottom line basically is security is uh, an important distraction for people uh, you know, looking at Iraq. It doesn't really stop major oil and gas development in the south. It doesn't really even affect it most of the time. But it does affect development of many of these areas that are unexplored presently in Iraq, uh, western Iraq, northern Iraq, central Iraq, and it prevents the government from spreading oilfield development around the country as a way to give the individual provinces hope that they'll one day share uh, in oil and gas revenues. Uh, but it's a detailed issue and we should take it up in questions. So thanks very much. So our final speaker is um, Kristen Hawes, who's the um, director of EAME for the Eurasia Group. Um, I've known Kristen for quite a long while. He's someone that has been, cons been both in and out of Iraq for a number of um, parts of his career, and he's also consulted widely with oil and gas companies. Um, we've brought Kristen into this final part of the presentation to basically address a simple question. So, you've got all of this huge potential that Adrian's outlined, You've got the potential conflict that we've just seen in both security and in politics. The question is, does Iraq, given those constraints and that opportunity, have the ability to be able to develop the infrastructure necessary to be able to make this production? And that's the question that Crispin's going to help us with. And Crispin, if you could give us a brief introduction, although sure. everybody, Crispin's just about to get married in a couple of weeks, and for some reason, his wife would like him to get back home to be able to help with some of the planning details. So he probably won't be able to walk with the Q&A that follows. Um, we'll just have to work yeah. around it. So apologies for that. Yeah. Crispin. Yeah, the idea of a divorce dispute being hastened by a grenade it seems ever more. Um, thank you, Robin. Um, as Robin said, I'm the director of the Middle East and North Africa group at Eurasia Group. Um, we are political risk consultants, which means nothing, really. Uh, political risk can mean 
uh, a geologist friend of mine said, do you do everything except for the rocks, don't you? And uh, it, it, it's everything from, I guess, from a, a bomb to a ministry bureaucracy malfunctioning. Um, and I'm afraid what I'm going to talk about is probably the less, uh, more to that end of it, the ministry, bu ministry bureaucracy malfunctioning. Well, can I just... Uh, um, as a gross generalisation, I would say that Iraq has, has not enough policy and too much politics. Um, and I think oil production policy is a fantastic example of that. You will probably know that as a result of the various licensing rounds and bids, <coughs> Iraq has a notional production target of 12 million barrels a day by 2017. However, not one single Iraqi designed that number. Um, Iraqi production policy was essentially, essentially a good example of passivity in Iraqi politics, where the production number was dictated by oil and gas companies bidding up production targets to a sufficiently large number that the per barrel fee that, that they were going to get paid by the Iraqi government would reach a rate of return that was acceptable. And I think most oil and gas executives involved in those licensing, licensing rounds, if you got them drunk enough or gave them enough sodium pentothal, would agree that deep down the, 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 the bid parameters were unrealistic and that they expected at some point for new opportunities to emerge within Iraq, but that they would not ultimately get you know, sink or swim on the basis of those production targets. In, outside the oil and gas companies, when we all saw the numbers, I don't think any of the people that work in my space thought was 12 million barrels was remotely possible. Somebody said, I don't think it's possible in West Texas, let alone in Iraq. So I, I think that um, where you have to start from is a perspective is, is what do the Iraqis actually want? What are they prepared to push for? And then even in terms of production, and even then are they actually capable of meeting their own targets, let alone the targets that ExxonMobil, BP, Shell, CNPC, Look Oil, Total, Petronas, etc., uh, saddled them with. But it's the point of passivity is important here, because having, for my sins, been working in the Middle East since uh, I went to university in Egypt 23 years ago now, so um, it's more than that, 27 years ago. Um, what I find is, is, is in, in uh, deeply established autocratic states in Iraq is, is clearly becoming one of, one of those in my view. What you tend to find is, not, uh, is an absence of strategic policy, an absence of long-term policy making, a determination to focus on the, sh focus on the short term. You could categorize that in, on the basis that if you are an ex-president of Syria, Egypt, Libya, as has been graphically demonstrated in the last year, your future is not playing golf in Santa Barbara. And therefore, you shouldn't focus on 10 years ahead. You should focus on what happens next week. Because if there's no next week for you, then nothing else matters. And I think this breeds short-term decision-making, short-term policy-making. And I think Iraq is moving in that direction. And as Nouri al-Maliki, as, as I think Toby very clearly demonstrated, is moving in that autocratic direction, I envisage Iraq making less and less long-term decisions, more and more focusing on the short term. And this has an, a, a distinctly negative impact on the oil and gas sector. If you're not going to look 10 years ahead, you're not going to put the, make the decisions that allow you to create the infrastructure that allows you to create the next piece of infrastructure that allows you to get production levels up to the point that would require you to build the next pipeline that would require you to fill a single point mooring facility at the export, export point. I would say that there are a large number of factors within Iraq that on a temporary basis also deter decision making, whether they be um, inter-ministerial uh, um, combat or, or competition. It's partly a legacy of distributing power through different political factions currently. It's partly a legacy of the Saddam era. Um, and when you look at the Iraqi government, and say, as Toby pointed out, the, 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 the Iraqi government has changed at least three times since uh, 2003. However, if you go and go in to sit in a ministry, very often everything up to the deputy ministerial level is you're talking to someone who was in the same ministry, in the same seat 10 years ago. And those inter-ministerial con conflicts that were fostered under the Saddam era are very often apparent now. So you can get everybody in the oil ministry to agree that they should be doing X. It's almost impossible to get everybody on the same, um, uh, the same path from the electricity ministry to agree to do what they need to do to facilitate developments in the oil ministry. So there are those issues. But I think there's, it's really also a question of policy. 
Uh, and I think, I'd, I think that, that if I'm going to leave you with anything, I think it would be the, the inability of an autocratically determined government to make the long type of long-term policy decisions that you require to develop the, the sector in this way. Now, as I said, ambitious targets. Um, that's the, 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 the top right is a fantastically ambitious target. Um, sorry, it's, sorry, it, it, it's, sorry, a fantastically successful uh, pattern, of beha- uh, pattern of activity in the past three years, the past seven years. I mean, look at that, the, the angle on that production gradient. By any standards, that's impressive. Um, if you draw that number up another five years according to the production target, it takes you up to 12 million barrels. Now, this is impressive. 12 million barrels would be astonishing in the time frame they're talking about. And I think the underlying factor here is, is the inadequacy of policy. Um, Iraq is making progress. The, the contracts in the south, they are of limited, uh, limited ambition in terms of the Iraqi spec, uh, side. They are difficult to work with. They're quite restrictive in terms of what, um, a, a, what a company can do. Uh, as, my, as, as Toby mentioned, there's a, there are lots of difficulties with bureau- bureaucracy. Um, but they are facilitating, for example, the creation of export uh, volume growth. So the adding of a, a single point mooring in March this year adds in theory nearly half a million barrels of export capacity. That will come online this year. There is a new single point mooring coming on at the beginning of next year. Even if it's delayed, it'll add another half a million barrels. So if we say that production at this point is somewhere in the region of around 2.7, something like that, heading upwards as the SPMs come online. Um, wh- this is going backwards. I mean, essentially, you have the production at the wellhead, and it's being facilitated by la- laterally adding export volume. At some point in the next year and a half, we'll reach the point where export capacity is higher than wellhead production capacity. And then you have to build wellhead production capacity. I would say that point is going to happen somewhere around 3.8 million barrels a day. So I think the current uh, trajectory of oil production in Iraq moves relatively, I won't say seamlessly, probably in a very jagged, haphazard way, up to around 3.8 million barrels a day by companies doing workovers on existing partially developed fields or huge, well-developed fields like Ramela. And then we reach about 3.8 million barrels a day, which is the watershed moment for Iraqi production. And the question there is, how do you get beyond that? The answer is this water injection project that Adrian talked about, which is the driver for long-term major production growth in the big West Gurna phase one, phase two projects in Majnoon, and actually many of the other fields in in that area. Um, That project has barely started. And we are reaching the point where, in the next three months, unless decisions are made to facilitate the first contracting elements of that project, then Iraq will not be able to drive beyond 3.8 million barrels a day. And the delay you see in those contracting decisions now will be added on to the time frame. And given the lack of progress that we've seen over the last 12 months, I think it would be extremely surprising if the decisions are made to facilitate the SSP, as it's known, um, are taken this year or perhaps even next year, in which case we're looking at Iraq very much, as, as, as Michael talked about, uh, improving to a security improving to a point and then stagnating. I think that is precisely what we can expect in the oil and gas sector. Production going up to 3.8 million and then stagnating. I would argue that part of this is because, again, that decision to, mo- to go to 12 million barrels was not taken by any Iraqi. There is no Iraqi official that feels a particular commitment to that. There is also a lack of capacity within the government to pursue decisions and enact the bureaucratic, um, but force the bureaucratic mechanisms to work to facilitate those developments. But fundamentally, it is a lack of commitment to that idea of, of 12 million barrels as a, as a realistic target. There is no doubt, as Adrian said, there is no doubt of the capacity for Iraq to fill in uh, a, a big element of the potential supply-demand gap in the next five to ten years. At, at Eurasia Group, we, we talk about four pillars of global oil production over the next ten years. Iraq, U.S. tight oil, oil sands, and Brazil. And Iraq is a key element of those four pillars. It is very difficult, with my experience of, of working in Iraq, 
on and off, I think I first went to Iraq in 1996, um, to see the progress being taken, the decisions being taken in this fractured political environment that is going to be focused essentially on redividing the distribution of power and the facilitation of the consolidation of power in Nouri al-Maliki's factions and coalitions of factions for it to take the long-term strategic decisions it needs to take in order to fac facilitate this type of growth. So if you look at Iraq two, in, in 2006, um, in the middle of a brutal civil war, um, and said, well, it, by, if by the end of 2014 Iraq was going to be producing nearly 4 million barrels a day, that would have looked like a great outcome. And potentially, for the needs, immediate needs of any Iraqi government in the next two, three years, that is a great outcome in terms of revenue. And that, again, may be part of the problem, that what is necessary or sufficient to keep the current government in place is not necessary or sufficient to meet global oil demand, or I would argue meet Iraq's potential uh, as, a, as, an, as an economic actor, quite apart from the, the uh, of fragmentation that, that implies in terms of the Iraqi domestic political environment. So on that somewhat downbeat um, note, um, I am afraid going to jump in a cab and try <laughs> and uh, repair the damage that is being done to my relationship at this point. But thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you very much for coming.